welcome to Menlo Park. So this is where the modern world is invented. Um, Edison created 400, as I mentioned earlier, of his most important inventions here. This is 1880 Menlo Park. So this street is Christie Street that you all came up on, and that's the first street in the world lit with Edison's perfected incandescent light. First he has his laboratory built. He has his father oversee the construction. It's 100 foot long, 25 foot wide, two stories. It faced the Pennsylvania Railroad that was there, now it's our Northeast Corridor. We are 174 feet above sea level. His workers are standing on the second um, layer here. They were watching the spires of Brooklyn Bridge being built. That's how high up we are. Um, he soon outgrew this building, and then he had constructed his machine shop. Glass house was made, it called that because it actually has a glass roof on one side to make blueprints. Later on, it's where the glass blower Ludwig Bohm lived, who made the first experimental light bulbs. Carpenter shed or pattern shop, blacksmith shop, carbon shed. His office was the first floor, his library was the second. Edison was a great reader, that's how he learned everything. He read and then he did. And so some, there are a lot of brilliant inventors that could read something and figure it out. You know, Tesla's one of them. Um, Edison wasn't like that. He had to put his hands on things. And so we have some amazing, amazing inventions that happened here. Um, the first experimental electric train, actually the battery house was right across the street. You can see it right there. Edison comes with an idea to Menlo Park. If you folks can move up, so keep that, that uh, clear, I appreciate that. Edison came to Menlo Park relatively, welcome everyone, relatively unknown. He had made two patents um, that made him kind of famous. And uh, he comes to Menlo Park, a young married man with two children, but he's got a drive. And that's the thing that keeps him going. And he has an idea that he wants to be the first in inventing. And so he works really hard at that. Um, Thomas Edison um, comes to Menlo Park in 1875 and buys about 35 acres of a failed housing development called Menlo Park. And uh, he doesn't name the site. It's already named for him. Menlo is a Gaelic or Irish word that means small pond or Menlo kettle ponds in the area. At the end of our trail, which if you have the uh, nerve to walk down in that icy snow, is uh, there's a pond at the end of it. We have 36 acres here today. We're a state park. So this is 1880 Menlo Park. And this is a very famous uh, drawing. It's a drawing, not a photo, done by one of Edison's uh, workers he hired later on to do advertisements. His name is Altcalt. He'll actually develop the uh, term, well, his work will inspire the term yellow journalism because he creates uh, political cartoons that um, change people's way of thinking. And he'll be, a, he's a, he also develops uh, the character uh, Buster Brown's, I mean, you have to be a certain age to remember Buster Brown. Um, but he creates a lot of amazing things. I'm just wondering if we can open up a little bit and if you folks can move a little bit forward, I'd like you to all see, please come forward, you can see better. We have plenty of openings right here. No one's standing right here. Come on over, don't be shy. You wanted it open, yeah. No, no, yeah. Come on over. Yeah, there you go. Um, this is all about commemoration. Edison comes here in 1875. He doesn't move in until 1876. He's traveling to England. He's conducting research on a transatlantic cable. I mean, he's really a mover and a shaker, but in a very um, quiet area. It's all with these inventors. It's not world famous for any reason. But let's talk a little bit about what motivates him here. Edison is born in 1847 in Milan, Ohio, a little town. It's actually got the same population today it had then. It's actually a beautiful town. You can go visit his home. These are his parents, Nancy and Samuel Edison. They'll have huge influence on him. Nancy had been a school teacher before her marriage. Thomas Edison's father, Samuel, was an entrepreneur in his own right. He actually made wooden shingles for houses. He was always trying to think of new ideas to make money because he had a family. Well, he had seven children. Only three of their children were survived to adulthood. Edison's quite sickly as a boy. 
and he will, um, his hearing will be affected and there is a history of, uh, of deafness in the family also. The family decides to move to Port Huron when Edison's seven years old because the railroad is moving here and the father's thinking this is a good way to go. You can see this is a much larger town. Edison's introduced now to cams, ratchets, gears. His mother said, well, he seems well enough now. Let's enroll him in school because I know he's a bright boy. They enroll him in school. This was the primer that the teacher had them buy and he lasted three months. The teacher thought he was adult, not very bright, and impossible to teach. Well, of course, Mrs. Edison took, you know, uh, she was outraged. She said, my son is bright. I was a school teacher. I can tell by the questions he asked. You know, we've all heard these stories. Brilliant people sometimes learn differently. Thomas Edison's mother taught him to read and write using this book, and in it were experiments. The brand new technology at that time was this. This is the first long communication system, the first long distance communication system in the world. It's called the Telegraph, which by the way was invented in Speedwell, New Jersey, about 10 years before Edison's birth. This is the height of technology. There are no telephones, there are no, there's no radio, and for you young guys, there's no television, movies. What were people to do? Edison read and he invented. <clears throat> Um, he also loved this book, Quantitative Chemical Analysis. I've heard a lot of visitors tell us that that is a college-level book. He said he conducted every experiment in it. He will become a very gifted chemist. This is an IEEE milestone site, which is the Institute of Electric and Electronic Engineers. Edison was one of the founders of this, along with Bell and Marconi and you know other people of that ilk. Um, but also, he was a very gifted chemist, so we're also American Chemical Society milestone site. Edison um, told his mother, 12 years old, you've taught me everything you know, mother. I somehow doubt that. But that's what he said, and he asked permission to get a job working on a train. He sold newspapers and candy. If you ever saw Harry Potter, you see that woman walking down selling those ter terrible tasting jelly beans. Um, that's what he did, basically. He had like a little box and he would sell, if he had tobacco or, or newspapers or candy. It was called a candy butcher. He was quite an entrepreneur. He noticed that people were hungry. Mother, if you have any extra food, if you could make sandwiches, and he sold them. If you have any extra veggies from the garden, he heard people talk, I have to stop at the market on the way home. And so he created that uh, the business um, also. Edison made more money than some adult men. He actually had to hire some of his friends to work underneath him. Um, he also had a few problems. Before he was working, he was doing chemical experiments in the house, actually, and his mother said, wow, that bad smell. And uh, those are, is that an explosion I heard? Out to the barn with you. So he took it out to the barn and he promptly burned the barn down to the ground. <laughs> Wow, he was in big trouble. His father made an example of him out in the town square. I'm sure it was pretty embarrassing. Um, Edison was trying to teach him to be a little safer. We hear about a lot of fires today. It was an unfortunate common occurrence at that time. What was lighting? What was the basis of lighting? What was the basis of heat? Cooking, everything was fire and so dangerous. Um, also, Edison got permission at one point to conduct experiments on the train. The train would pick him up in his hometown of Port Huron. It would stop at all the stops on the way to the big city of Detroit. Edison would get on and off, picking up packages, helping out as best he could. He also was bothering all the telegraph operators because they were located inside the train um, station because it followed the right of way down. Show me, can you show me something? And they're like, get out of here, kid, we're busy. This is the middle of the American Civil War. It was a very busy time. But then the train stopped in Detroit three hours. What was a young, curious guy to do? Well, Edison paid money and bought a subscription to the Detroit Library. He said he read every book in there. I don't know. We don't know. Maybe there were 20 books. Who knows? Um, but also, he got permission to conduct science experiments on the train. And Thomas Edison did really um, a good job, but he wasn't so careful with his chemicals. He was told, put them away safely every day. And one day he didn't tie down all his phosphorus. And when they train, you know, trains, they buck sometimes when they take off, it spills on phosphorus onto the mailbags. 
the train's on fire. Oh my gosh, what are they going to do? They pull the, the brake and everyone's thrown off the train, including Edison and his chemicals. They were not allowed back on. Edison was allowed back on, but there were no chemicals allowed back on. Now what am I going to do? He's curious. What am I going to do? Then he gets an idea. He said, wait a minute. I know what's happening in these battles before the people do because it, all the information is coming through the telegraphs. I saw a used printing press for shop, on, uh, you know, in, in the shop's uh, window. I'm going to go buy that. He makes the first newspaper on a moving train. This is a copy of one. It was called the Weekly Herald, published by A. Edison. He's called Al or Alva when he's a boy. That actually is the name of his father's best friend, Alva Bradley. He was a sea captain. Edison, and actually it's pretty interesting, spelling errors and all, so please come on over. I did look it up. Webster's Dictionary wasn't published yet. That could be why, right? Um, creating the newspaper. One day he's on his way to work, his arms are filled down with all the supplies he needs. He sees a baby playing by the railroad tracks and he sees that the baggage cart is not going to stop in, top, in time. You see the man up top furiously turning the wheel, trying to put the brake on. Edison makes a split second decision that would change his life. He dives in, he grabs the baby, they're safe. The baby's crying, scared, of course, they know where I do where this missile came from. And Edison's brushing himself off, but the crowd sees what's going on, and uh, they form around him, giving you know an "atta boy, good job." And Edison's fine, just you know cleaning himself off. And the station master and head telegraph operator comes out. What's going on out here? And they say, "Well, that Edison kid, he saved some baby's life." You mean that kid that burned his family's barn down? <laughs> Did he burn the tree? Let what's going on? Let me see. And he walks over, and this is a man of some, sub, of some substance, and the crowd parts. And the man named Mr. McKenzie almost drops to his knees. That's no mere boy. That's his son. Well, he was so grateful to young Edison that he immediately put his hand in his pocket to give him a reward. And he said, no, sir, I couldn't accept that. And he's like, young man, you have, there's something I must be able to do for you. Edison's thinking, you know, he's a quick thinker. Well, you know, I've been wanting to learn more about the telegraph. Can you teach me some of the tricks? You know, I built my own. I built one for my neighbor. I memorized Morse code, but I don't understand all the in intricacies involved with it. Now, it's Mr. McKenzie's turn to think for a moment. You know what? How about this? How old are you? I'm 15, sir. How about if I train you, apprentice you, but you'll have to move in with my family and I. Go home and get your parents' permission. And they agree. This will change Edison's life. Here he is proudly wearing his telegraph uniform. Edison becomes an itinerant telegrapher traveling all around the United States, parts of Canada. He winds up at one point in Boston, which is a very tight and very well-established telegraph community. He works for Western Union, the largest employer in the world during the nighttime. He likes to keep his days open so he can work on inventions, renting a little space in the Charles William Jr. shop. This is actually a very prominent spot also. They also have an IEEE milestone plaque. Edison is 21 years old and he's been making inventions all along but never had the money to pay for the patent application. $15, that was a hefty sum at that time. Edison's telling his friends, I read something in a journal and he's selling double transmitters, he's making all kinds of things. He read in a journal and he gave him an idea for this machine. It's called a vote recording machine. His idea, each member of the legislature in Massachusetts, that's where he's living, would have one in front of their desk. When the vote comes up, they can either press this button for yes, this button for no, it sends a signal along a, uh, uh, um, a wire, dropping the chemical on a pre-treated piece of paper, voting will be quick. He brings it to them, he shows it to them, does a demonstration, and they're like incredulous. Why would we want this machine? We need our voting to be slow. We need a filibuster. We need to discuss issues. I want to change their minds over there. I don't want to rush it. So some people later on in Edison's life will say, oh, your first patent, I'm so sorry, it was a failure. He was very upset about that. That was no failure. Do you know what I learned from this experience? Never again to create something that doesn't have a practical purpose. 
He said, I learned so much for this. You can't call that a failure. Edison not only has no money, he owes money. He finally gets a promise of a job in New York City. One of his friends works for a division of Western Union called the Golden Stock Indicator Company, a friend named Franklin Pope. He had been a telegrapher also. Edison takes him too long, though, to get the steamship fare from Boston to New York. By the time he arrives, the job's filled. Pope feels bad, though. He said, look, you can sleep in the cot in the back room until you find employment. Edison is fascinated by this machine that Mr. Pope's in charge of. It's called a stock ticker. And it's really what's running New York City at that time because it's all about money. And Edison's fascinated, he's watching it. And part of your work as a telegrapher was you had to be able to take this machine apart and put it back together. Edison had been making improvements on it all along, never having the money or the knowledge of how to put that in his name. So he comes in and one day and the place down the street where the uh, shop was and the place is in uproar. People are in the street screaming, what's the price of gold? What's the price of silver? He comes over to the shop and he looks in and he sees his friend with a very important looking man who happened to be the president of Western Union named William Orton. And he's pointing his finger at, finger at Mr. Pope yelling. And Mr. Orton doesn't know what to do. He's working on the machine. He can't seem to figure out what the problem is. He spots Edison and he tells his young assistant, go get Mr. Edison. He's really good with mechanisms. He's got a good reputation. Edison comes over and he's like, I didn't do it. What's going on? <laughs> he said, no, no, this machine stopped working. I need a pair of fresh eyes on it. I can't seem to figure out what's wrong. Well, Edison has this almost like symbiotic relationship with mechanisms. He loves it. And he walks around the machine and he's glancing at it and he's going up and down. All of a sudden he sees a little spring is out of place. Boop, in. The machine's working. Everyone's patting him on the back. Mr. Orton said, hire this man. He's your new assistant. And then he sees something in Edison. He takes a little chance on him. You know, I don't know what it was, but he becomes one of Edison's greatest mentors. And he told Edison, I'd like to make an arrangement with you. I'd like to give you some of my men and some money and, and a place to work. And I want you to work on improvements on the stock ticker and on the uh, telegraph machine. Well, Edison, that's a dream come true for Edison. He loves this. But what Mr. Orton notices is that Edison's always trying to improve. It's never quick, done, I'm out. Let me keep working on it. I'm going to study this. Let me read some more. And this is what Mr. Orton sees and understands about Edison. Edison and his friend uh, Pope, they'll create this device. This is called the universal stock ticker, and this is the unison coil. Before this time, it's really a beautifully illustrated piece right here, um, the prices of gold and silver would go out to these different clearing houses, and the synchronization would get out of whack. And then they'd have to send somebody like you, go fix that, or they, or somebody would have undue influence on the machine, uh, on the pricing, excuse me, they'd have it ahead of somebody else. And so it was a real problem. They create this machine, and all Mr. Orton asked was, we have first right of refusal at my company. If we don't want to buy it, you're more than welcome to sell it other, you know, elsewhere. For whatever reason, Pope sends young, inexperienced Edison, who's probably 22 at this time, to make the negotiation. Edison had talked to him beforehand. How much should we ask? Should we ask 2,000, 3,000? Do we dare say four? I don't know. Edison shows up and he loses his nerve. He sees all these men, so much more experienced than he is. And he says, how much would you like to pay us for it? Never a good opening negotiation, of course. And they go and talk and they amongst themselves and they come back to him and they say, how does $40,000 sound? Mm. Well, it sounded pretty darn good to Edison. Now $40,000 then is like three quarters to a million dollars today. Edison couldn't believe their luck. He signs on the dotted line and then he's feeling a little bad afterwards or sometimes I wonder, was he bragging a little bit? He said, you know, we would have accepted three or four thousand dollars. We're, you know, overwhelmed. And uh, the gentleman came back to us and said, listen, don't worry, you didn't take advantage of us. We were authorized to offer you up to $80,000. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that Edison felt all that bad because he really could have retired for life, but that's not him. 
he actually moves to Newark, New Jersey. He opens up this shop right here on Ward Street, now known as Innocent Place. And he's hmm? making improved telegraph machines, stock tickers, and fire alarms. He has a new partner, and his new partner hires a few young ladies to work doing testing. This is one of them right here, Mary Stillwell. She's a beautiful young girl. Everyone in the shop knows Edison's smitten with her, but he's too shy. He's, you know, he's from a machine shop culture. He isn't used to speaking to young girls like that. And, he finally gets the nerve to talk to her. He walks over to her one day and very nicely tells her what a good job she's doing as a worker. He knows that she's very diligent and then promptly says, how about if we get married next Tuesday? <laughs> Never the smooth operator. Um, she said, of course, I have to go talk to my mother. She was 16 years old, which I know sounds scandalous today, completely in the norm at that time. Um, they, the father doesn't allow The father was an alderman in Newark. He's a man of some reputation. He does not allow his daughter to marry um, the next week. But Edison is a pretty prominent man. He's actually pretty good looking too. Not a bad looking guy. And so they do marry three months later, Christmas Day, 1871. Edison is 24, she is 16. Um, they'll be married until her untimely death in 1884 at the age of 29. Mm. They mm. have three here at Menlo. They have three. I'm sorry? She died. Uh, they actually really don't know, but the new theory is that she wasn't very well after the birth of their third child was born here, and uh, she was self-medicating with um, morphine. They think it was an opiate problem. So, um, and she didn't look quite like that when she died. She actually, they said she had an addiction to chocolate, but I really feel for her because I have that same addiction myself <laughs> to the chocolate. But, and it wasn't an addiction to an opiate, don't get me wrong. It was for medicinal purposes. But, you know, you, anyone could go buy it in the store. It wasn't a prescription. Um, it, it was very tragic. Edison was heartbroken. Actually, we just had an, an article recently that there's a little clip they found, because um, we work very closely with the Edison Papers Project in the National Park, and they think that he tried to revive her with electricity. It did not work, unfortunately. Um, Edison does have three children with his wife. Uh, first, they have their daughter, Marion, pictured right here, and then their son, Tom Jr. They're born in Newark, New Jersey. Little William in the middle, he'll be born here. Edison is a great fun, teaser, always joking. He nicknames, uh, this is the Invention Factory. He calls one of his um, employees culture because the man likes um, classical music. Edison Moore was, was like more like a stage type of music person. Um, and he calls his daughter Marion Dot and his son Tom Jr. Dash mm -hmm. after his love of Morse code. I've read uh, letters that he wrote to her when she was a married woman, still dear Dot. Um, Will, we don't know that he has a, uh, a nickname at all, poor thing. Um, Edison comes here and he buys the property in 1875. He comes back from England. Right before he left, though, he had created this invention in his Newark office called a quadruplex. Now you can send four messages over one line. He got another $40,000 for that. He probably spent that on building this and filling it with everything he thought he needed. And he saw these amazing electrical test instruments over in Europe. He was conducting research on the printing telegraph with the cable that ran underneath the ocean all the way over to England. Not successful, by the way. There was a resistance problem, which he'll later on use to a positive effect in another invention. This is called a, a resistance tester. It was used here at Menlo. It measures the resistance of different metals. On the side, there's platinum, aluminum, tin, uh, lead, silver, and they're all listed. You're more than welcome to come over and look at it. This is called a galvanometer. It measures electric current. Now, when, before we go in the back, I'm going to um, take a little time so those of you who are in the back can come up. And you're more than welcome to take photos. We do ask, though, that you don't use flash, but photos are welcome. Edison comes back from England. He moves his wife and two children into this lovely home, which actually had running water, very unusual. Um, of course, gravity was helping because it was at the end of the street on the left. Um, it was right where, just a good point, right above your head, where this tablet is today. That's Edison at the um, 
induction of that tablet in 1925. He's 29 years old. As I mentioned, relatively unknown. Change places with you. Mm -hmm. He is the most famous man in the world in 1877 because he invents the phonograph. This is his height without shoes on. This is a very popular selfie spot, I'm just saying. And uh, this is his original eyepiece, his jeweler's loop. So we'd like to think there's a little Edison DNA in there. Who knows what we could do with that in the future. Um, this is actually a really beautiful poem. If you could take a few moments to look at it, it gives you a little perspective of how people thought so deeply about it. Edison truly invented the modern age here. Nobody had electricity in their home. Nobody. He creates the electrical distribution system. Every system after that will be based on his system. He is his most prolific here. When we walk through the museum, there's a histograph right here. You'll see the chart of his American inventions. Menlo Park is where it keeps shooting upwards. This is his favorite spot, and it is where he created, as I said, his most popular inventions. We're going to go and go back into Menlo Park in the back room, and I'm going to play the 117-year-old phonographs. We'll talk about the machine shop, the work he does on generators and batteries, uh, and know that this is the birthplace of modern research and development, and they're still studying today. How could he be so productive? And no, he didn't hire really brilliant people and put his name on their inventions. That's just not how it worked. And if you read the biographies of his employees, you'll see that. Any questions? Please, let's go.